I'm going to welcome our first guest speaker up to the stage, uh, Patrick Schwing. And something that I started doing some time ago for each of my guest speakers, because you know you read a lot of things that people say like, oh, I feel like scientists aren't relate relatable. Like I don't, I don't know, you know, what we have in common. So how can I, I really hear what they're saying? So I started doing this thing that my guest speakers either love or they hate. But I started asking them for fun facts about themselves. And so um, Patrick's fun fact is that when he isn't in the lab or field, he enjoys brewing beer and playing music. So with that. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, Emily and Sea Grant, for having me this morning, and it's a pleasure to be here. Look forward to uh, seeing all the other presentations and chatting over lunch with you guys. So, um, okay, so first of all, uh, I need to acknowledge the fact that I'm not the only person that's contributed to this, this presentation. There are multiple other people that have contributed data and figures, so they are all here as my co-authors. And I also need to acknowledge uh, Gomri for funding the majority of this research. So, benthic foraminifera. I promise in a few slides I'll tell you all about them. But uh, first of all, they have been really uh, valuable to us over the past several decades, looking at millions of years of change uh, environmentally, primarily from sediments that were collected in the ocean. And uh, today, uh, since about 2010, we've also realized how valuable they are in oil spill science. So I'm going to give you guys a little bit of an idea of how we've used them over the past uh, what, eight, nine years now, um, in oil spill uh, science. So impact, response, recovery, that type of thing. Okay, so uh, if you fall asleep halfway through the presentation, the two takeaway messages are right here. <laughs> Number one, human health and the Gulf economy are both dependent upon the seafloor of the Gulf of Mexico uh, and services that they provide, that the organisms that live on the seafloor provide. And then secondly, Benthic foraminifera are effective indicators of how healthy that seafloor is. Um, and this is in the context of oil spills and other stressors, be they natural or human. Okay, so I'm gonna zoom way out and, we'll, and then we'll, we'll zoom in a little bit. So first of all, there's a huge investment in, in oil and gas extraction in the Gulf of Mexico. You guys all know this. Uh, just wanted to provide some context here. So it, the Gulf of Mexico produces about 9% of the world's oil, about 11% of the world's gas. Um, and you can see the distribution of, of wells currently in the Gulf of Mexico and um, on the southwestern portion of the Gulf of Mexico along the Mexican coastline. What's interesting is, is all of the dark, uh, or as they get darker, I guess, in the, in the black and dark grays, these are the most recent wells. So we're kind of marching down slope into deeper and deeper water. And, um, you know, the short answer to that question at the bottom of the last slide, are we running out of places to drill? The short answer is no. Um, in 1996, there were no oil wells or, sorry, deeper than 1,500 meters, which is about the same depth as the Deepwater Horizon. And that's the demarcation between normal drilling and deep water drilling. As of, what, 20 years later or so, in 2014, nearly half of the oil and gas coming out of the Gulf of Mexico is deeper than 1,500 meters. There you go. So, and this is a broader, uh, not concern necessarily, but consideration uh, than just the Gulf of Mexico. Each one of these blue dots is an area where there's current deep water exploration or intended deep water exploration in the case of the Arctic. Um, and all of the red dots are the areas where leaks or spills have occurred in deep water uh, exploration. One of those is the Gulf of Mexico. And the two largest spills, submarine spills in history occurred in the Gulf of Mexico. The one that most of us will be talking about today is the Deepwater Horizon, 2010 happened about a mile deep, 1,500 meters, over about eight, uh, 87 days. And uh, a less popular, or uh, there wasn't a lot of press coverage about the Ixtox spill back in 1979, uh, but it lasted almost, uh, almost 10 months. It was much shallower than the Deepwater Horizon, but it was still subsurface, so there are a lot of similarities. And um, I'm gonna show you a few slides today about uh, some of the records that we've collected in the Southern Gulf of Mexico, trying to find um, long-term traces of the Ixtox spill. So what's interesting here is, is that it didn't only impact deep water areas or coastlines in Mexico, um, it made its way all the way up to Texas. So when you're talking about response, uh, we need to start thinking about intergovernmental, federal governments, US and Mexico collaborating together in response efforts. Okay, so the deep water horizon affected the seafloor in two very specific ways. Um, somewhat un unexpectedly in many cases. 
the first one we call MOSFA. It's a mouthful, it's a lot of jargon. I apologize, but I'll break this down. So this is a uh, marine oil snow, sedimentation and flocculent accumulation. So basically what happened is at the surface and in the water column, you have a conglomeration of zooplankton, phytoplankton, bacteria, uh, material coming from the Mississippi River from the continent, and then you add oil and dispersants to that. And it gloms together and sinks really rapidly to the seafloor. The second one is, uh, so the first one we, we sort of colloquially call it a dirty blizzard. Uh, the, the second one is the intrusion. Um, so oil floats, right? That was the, the common understanding. In this case, it was so deep that a lot of the droplets and dissolved oil reached a neutral buoyancy before it reached the surface, and it started moving horizontally. And so it impinged directly upon uh, the seafloor in certain cases. So we call this the bathtub ring, because it more or less left a bathtub ring on the Gulf of Mexico. So with both of those mechanisms delivering oil to the seafloor, this changed seafloor conditions quite a bit. So first of all, there was a fourfold increase in the overall amount of material being deposited on the seafloor. And that caused a uh, decrease in the amount of oxygen right at the seafloor where a lot of the organisms live. So that lasted up to three years after the deepwater horizon. And then there was also a two to threefold increase in hydrocarbon concentrations. Okay, so you have kind of a double whammy of less oxygen and more toxic compounds being delivered. <clears throat> This is what the footprint of that dirty blizzard looked like. So the red highlighted area here is, is the, the heaviest um, deposition or the largest amount of deposition. There's some green areas over here that we've also highlighted that were lower, but still um, significantly above what was there naturally. Um, if you add up all this, the space between all of these black outlined areas, it's about the size of Maryland, so 35,000 square kilometers. And based upon this area and the amount of material going to the seafloor, it accounted for about 14% of all of the oil that came out of the wellhead. So that's um, about 43 Olympic sized swimming pools going to the, the seafloor. That's just the oil portion. That's not all of the other material that was associated with it. So, great. There's a bunch of oil and, and marine oil snow on the seafloor. Why do we care? First of all, the Deepwater Horizon well site at 1500 meters is actually the depth at which there is the, the highest amount of different species, so species richness of benthic fauna, so those are the organisms that live on the seafloor, um, and they're really good indicators of general ecological health. So if you have a good understanding of how healthy the seafloor is, it usually pays its way up into the water as well. Um, there's legal authority to include a lot of these species in, and I'll show you what they look like here in a second, in um, the natural resource damage assessment. <coughs> And then last but not least, if you think about sort of the balance between um, spatial and volume of, of different ecosystems in the Gulf of Mexico, the, the benthic or seafloor ecosystem is actually the largest spatial ecosystem uh, in the Gulf. So with that in mind, these organisms and the seafloor itself provide a lot of what we call ecosystem services. So things that humans benefit from, things that other organisms benefit from in the Gulf. So some of those are listed here. I won't go through all of them, but some of the main ones are carbon absorption. So uh, human uh, carbon emissions, the, the deep sea is actually absorbing a lot of that. There's direct food provision. So the things that we like to put on our dinner plate, so crab, shrimp, uh, tilefish, grouper, snapper, they're all dependent on the seafloor. And then secondly, if you're thinking about things that eat things off of the seafloor, so a lot of the tilefish, a lot of the grouper and snapper will eat the smaller organisms off the seafloor and it also provides habitat for them. Um, they have some intrinsic value, uh, so there's genetic resources and biodiversity, and then last but not least, they uh, absorb or, or detoxify a lot of um, waste that tends to go to the bottom of, of the Gulf and the, the ocean in general. <clears throat> All right, so what do some of these uh, groups look like? Well, we've got microbes, bacteria, which I didn't put a picture up here of, because they're multiple and very small. Um, benthic foraminifera are right here, so you can see a few photos of those, and I'll go into detail about those. Um, from benthic foraminifera, we basically move up in size. So there's myofauna, macrofauna, megafauna, um, and you can see some of the examples here. You've got a few um, shells, shrimp, worms. Uh, you get into the megafauna, and you're talking about like golden crabs, uh, sea stars, brittle stars, that type of thing. And then ultimately, wherever we have hard bottom, you usually see corals, deep sea corals um, and mesophotic corals, which are sort of in between shallow and deep. 
All right, so there's a lot of text on this slide. I apologize, but I think forams are pretty cool. So we called foram, foraminifera, forams for short, so that's the nickname. Uh, there are some that live on the seafloor. Those, those are the benthic ones. Those are the ones that I'll talk about today. There's also some that live in the water column. So those are planktic forams. Um, they secrete a hard calcite shell. Uh, they're exactly the same composition as a lot of the shells that you might find on the beach, but they're much smaller. They're about the size of a pencil tip. And um, like I said, uh, they contribute to that sort of detoxification and decomposition of a lot of the waste that goes to the seafloor. They typically turn it into you know, useful minerals. Um, they're also a food source for some of those larger organisms that I showed you on the previous slide. And um, I use them, uh, most importantly, I think, as bioindicators. So they, they respond pretty quickly to any sort of changes in their environment, be that temperature, salinity, oil contamination, whatever it is. The cool thing is, is that their shells are hard parts, so they're well preserved in sedimentary layers. And sedimentary layers are perfect for going back in history. You can kind of peel each layer back and go back in time and look at what the environmental setting was like hundreds, thousands, and even millions of years ago. All right, so two main objectives for today. I'll get through these quickly. Um, I want to show you how we assess the impacts and any lasting changes uh, in benthic systems um, caused by the Deepwater Horizon and the Ixtoc oil spills. And then I also want to show you a little bit about how we're preparing for the future using baseline um, establishment now so that if an oil spill happens tomorrow, we actually have a good measure of any changes. All right, so through the um, Sea Image Consortium here, we've gone out and we've sampled uh, all over the Gulf of Mexico, the US, Mexico, and Cuban waters. And I'm gonna show you some data from about 100 sites, a little bit more than that. We use a multi-core system. Uh, so it, it basically throw it over the side on a cable. It takes short sediment tube or short uh, plastic tubes and collects sediment off of the uh, seafloor. You can see an example of that right here. And so we get these columns of sediment that are really well preserved. So we take them off the multi-core, we take some initial measurements and observations on deck, uh, and then we ultimately take it back to the lab and we extrude it. So we push the sediment up through the tube and slice it at very fine intervals. Uh, in this case, it's about two millimeters. So some of the cores that we collected initially, uh, just to give you an idea of what they look like, these were both collected uh, in 2010, during and just after the Deepwater Horizon, and just a visual comparison can tell you quite a bit. So if you look at the bottom portion here, this is what, what a natural signal would primarily look like. It looks bioturbated. So that basically just means that organisms are in there moving things around. There's a lot of activity. Above that, you see fine layers or fine laminations. Um, and you can actually see the oxygen boundary right here. That's the color difference. And so there's no, in the surface, in the 2010 layer, there's no bioturbation, there's no mixing going on, there's no biological activity, or at least less biological activity. So just visually, you can tell the difference. Putting that a uh, few numbers on this, and this is kind of a busy slide, but I'll walk you through it. Uh, um, on the left, we have the, the first, some of the first 4AM data that we, that we generated, and on the right, we have some of the environmental controls. So these are all of the natural sediments that I showed you, those bioturbated sediments here. Um, and we're looking at density, so that's the number of 4 amps per volume. And you're also looking at diversity, so basically who's there. Um, it's a good measure of how healthy the system is. And you can see both of these decline after the Deepwater Horizon layer is deposited. So uh, this is 80 to 90 percent decrease, and this is about a 30 to 40 percent decrease. And it's consistent with that two to three-fold increase in oil concentrations that I told you about at the beginning. And it's also consistent with that less surface oxygen. So it's kind of, like I said, a double whammy. These guys are responding to both stressors. All right, so we've assessed an impact. We wanted to see if we could use 4 amps to document recovery of the seafloor. And what we did was, is we took the surface sediment from those cores, you know, probably the top five centimeters, a few inches, uh, from 2011 to 2015. And we looked at two measures of diversity and we looked at uh, density consistently and found that there was a gradual increase uh, from 2011 to 2013-14, and then it plateaued off. So you can see here, uh, 14, 13, 14, 15, there's no increase from then on. So the takeaway message here is that it took about three to five years for the seafloor or benthic foraminifera to reach a steady state. We can't say that it's a full recovery, 
because in many cases we didn't have collections in these areas prior to 2010. The ones that we do, the communities in 2015 don't look anything like the ones in, uh, prior to 2010 in some cases. So we can't call this a complete recovery, but it has reached a new normal or a new steady state. <laughs> All right, so moving to the Southern Gulf, uh, Ixtoc 1, uh, got the, the spill and the surface expression of the oil here. And we're using a classic geological tenet that the present is the key to the past and the past is a window to see in the future. So we're using Deepwater Horizon as our present case. We wanna see if there are any records in the sediments of the Ixtoc spill to help us forecast what the Northern Gulf might look like 20 to 30 years from now. And then we wanna use both of these spills to help us prepare for the future. So this is uh, the same footprint uh, method that we use for the Northern Gulf, um, the extent uh, was about 53,000 square kilometers of marine oil snow deposition. And that's consistent with the surface, uh, sea surface uh, spatial extent that was, that was calculated in 2015. Looking at impacts, I'm gonna keep this really simple. These are the, the deep water horizon records here. These are the records that I showed you at the beginning where there's a, a decrease in diversity during the deep water horizon. We see exactly the same magnitude of decrease in benthic 4M diversity during the Ixtoc layer, so the 1979-1980 layer, and it's been preserved for nearly 40 years. So that's really interesting. We actually have a record of impact and recovery that's preserved in the sediments of the Southern Gulf of Mexico. All right, so we've talked about present, we've talked a little bit about past, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about now, how we're preparing for the future. One way to do that, one of the shortcomings or shortfalls that we identified early on in the Deepwater Horizon response was there aren't any baselines in many of these areas. And for many of the things that we have found are pretty valuable to have during an oil spill, benthic forums being one of them. And so we're currently creating baselines, at least from 2015 to 2018, as sort of a benchmark, uh, a new normal. Five minutes, cool, thanks. Um, so that if a, a spill happens tomorrow, we know what was happening today. We can actually quantitatively measure the difference and assess an impact and recovery. So I'll show you a little bit about what these uh, post-spill baselines look like, um, how we can use them to prepare for future disturbances, and then are there any other valuable things that we can get from these measurements? The slide always takes forever to load, sorry. There it is, okay. Really busy, but ultimately uh, these five maps represent different parameters of things that we have measured that were useful um, in benthic foraminifera for the entire Gulf of Mexico. We're filling in gaps here and here, um, but overall, the data behind these maps could come in handy if another oil spill happens. We can actually measure, again, how things have been impacted or changed, or, or not, if another oil spill happens. Um, another outcome of this type of survey is that we didn't have collections in, in a lot of these areas prior to this, uh, prior to 2010. And so we're starting to get a good idea of how these regions are connected. So I'm not gonna go through all of the data in the tables or anything, but if you look at just these numbers here on the black arrows, those are the number of species related or similar species between each region, right? So this number here between Cuba and the Northern Gulf of Mexico is much lower than the other two. And so the reason that that's important is if you have an impact like an oil spill, um, foreign reproduction is primarily passive. It's, it's based on the currents. And so if there's no connectivity between two regions, they can't recolonize the region that was impacted, right? So this is important. We didn't really know this before the oil spill. Um, so I've been talking about benthic forams, um, but putting this into a larger context, we have uh, physical and chemical measurements throughout the Gulf. We have some of the larger <coughs> organisms that live on the seafloor. And we also have the things that everybody cares about. Uh, all the, the benthic dependent fish. Um, and so when you start layering all these baselines together and you look at how the physical and chem chemical measurements are changing and how those mirror all of the biological changes, you can get a really good idea of what, how it's sort of paying up through the food chain or the food web. Um, and again, for most cases, in, in, especially in deep waters of the Gulf of Mexico, we didn't have this prior to the oil spill. So this is another good outcome uh, from these surveys. All right. Oil spills are just one stressor. And that was another concern early on, is how do we tell impact from just an oil spill when you have all of these other things going on in the Gulf of Mexico? Hurricanes, uh, marine debris and, and plastics, uh, you know, chronic pollution from oil seeps, hypoxia. Um, and so this is a difficult task. 
One of the things that um, I'm working on with a few grad students right now, um, and this is you know uh, hot off the press new stuff going on, uh, is working on biomonitoring using forams. And I would I would argue that the Gulf needs a regional tool to monitor benthic ecological quality status. Um, and one of those tools that we're trying to develop in response to this is called AMBI. Uh, it's a marine biotic index. Um, it's easy to interpret. It's relatively uh, inexpensive. Um, and it reflects mo changes of the seafloor to most of those stressors that I identified on the previous slide. So I welcome input from any managers out there, resource managers out there. I would love to talk to you guys about how to implement this. All right, I'm running short on time. <laughs> so I'll wrap this up. Overall, three takeaways for forams. They're useful uh, in the context of oil spills for multiple reasons. Um, I would say that they're important to include in baselines because of their utility. Uh, in, in oil spill response and recovery, and um, I would argue that they should be used um, as a bioindicator of ecological quality status moving forward. Um, broader implications, we're we now have a basic understanding of the interconnectivity between multiple trophic levels and spatial connectivity, and um, we always like to say that there's only two degrees of separation between the seafloor and your dinner plate. If you eat shrimp and crabs, it's only one, and this is why at the very beginning I said, human health and the Gulf economy are dependent upon seafloor services. All right, all of the baseline data is available in that second book. This is a series from the Sea Image Consortium. You're welcome to scan that VR code. I'm out of time. Okay, two seconds. Um, so that's all in this book. All of the data is on the GridC website that Emily referenced, uh, so you're welcome to check it out. Um, see if, if you disagree with my interpretation, I welcome it. Um, I'm available via email or Twitter. I think you're going to hold questions until the panel. Is that right? Okay, cool. Thank you all.